In this set of notes, I'm going to be going over DNA structure and replication. So for the outline of these notes today, I'm going to start with just an overview of what DNA is, then uh, talk about the structure of DNA focusing on nucleotides and bases, and then we'll review the steps of how DNA is replicated. So you can pause at each slide in the video and fill in the guided notes found in the description below, or you can watch the video straight through to just have a better understanding of DNA. So let's get started. So DNA stands for deoxyribose nucleic acid. Nucleic acids are a macromolecule that make up living organisms, and they're specific for the storage and transferring of genetic information. And deoxyribose is the name of the sugar specific to DNA. So it is a nucleic acid, and we can specify it by its sugar, deoxyribose, giving us its full name, deoxyribose nucleic acid, better known as DNA. So DNA is known as the blueprint of life. It has all of the information necessary to tell your cells what proteins to make and gives it how it's going to look and how it's going to function and is super important because even though it's not part of the final product, there would be no product without this instruction manual of DNA which is found across all living organisms of all types. If you are made of at least one or more cells, you have DNA giving you the instructions of what you're going to look like and how you're going to function. So DNA's structure is pretty universally recognized. We've seen this image uh, lots of times all over, this sort of twisted uh, ladder shape. So it's a double-stranded molecule. It has these two polymers of nucleotides, meaning it has a chain of repeated subunits, which are called nucleotides. And these two strands complement each other and have a binding pattern, and they come together in that twisted ladder shape, better known as a double helix. So we're gonna zoom in and break down these subunits and what's going on to make up this final structure that we've seen so often. So macromolecules are macro, they're big, because they're made up of repeated subunits or building blocks. And the scientific word for this building block is monomer. So the monomer of nucleic acids are nucleotides. And we can break it down even further because nucleotides consist of three parts. So in the nucleotides of DNA, we are going to have a sugar that we mentioned earlier, deoxyribose. It has this pentagon shape and it is a pentose sugar. Then we're going to have a phosphate group. So we see this phosphorus connected to our sugar, making up the phosphate group. Then here is the nitrogenous base. It is made up of nitrogen rings. You can see here we have some nitrogens and that's going to be the nitrogenous base. Together this makes our nucleotide and we have a repeated uh, pattern of multiple nucleotides making up our DNA. Now the sugars and phosphates make up what we call the backbone of DNA. So these repeated units go over and over and the sugar and phosphates are found in sort of this outside part of DNA. If you're looking at it like a ladder, it'd be sort of where your hands are to stabilize yourself. The nitrogenous bases make up the inside rungs of our ladder and DNA molecule. And this is where the information is coded. So the the phosphates and sugars make up structurally sort of the outer part of DNA. And inside is where all this code information is stored. And the sequence and the order of these nitro of the nitrogenous bases gives us the genetic variety we see amongst living organisms. So even though we have a lot of variety in life, because of the sequence of these nitrogenous bases, it is called, DNA is called the universal code of life because there's only four bases amongst all living organisms. And the pattern and order and how many of these four bases we have gives us the variety you see on Earth. 
So we need to know what the four nitrogenous bases are. We have adenine, guanine, thymine, and cytosine. And these four bases can be split into two categories based off of their structure. We have the purines, which are made up of two nitrogen rings. So adenine, you can see here, has two nitrogen rings, and so does guanine. The pyrimidines, however, only have one nitrogen ring, and that's going to be thymine and cytosine. And a good way to remember it is pyrimidines has Y in the name, and our two bases with Ys in their names are the pyrimidines, thymine and cytosine. So because of these structures, there's going to be a pattern that we need to know of how they bind together the double stranded uh, the two strands of DNA. So adenine and thymine will always come together. We have the purine and pyrimidine giving us two rings and a single ring coming together and that's going to make our adenine to thymine or T to A connection. So I have it both ways here, A and T, T and A. The other purine pyrimidine combo we have is our cytosine and guanine. And so G to C or C to G. And this is the base pairing rules of DNA. The two strands come together and the bases, how they match up, will always go in this pattern. Meaning that in any DNA molecule, the number of adenines should be equal to the number of thymines and the same applies for cytosine and guanine. And this is going to be important in how we replicate DNA and how we read this genetic code by knowing these base pairing rules. So since DNA provides the instruction for cells, every time we need to make new cells via cell division, we need to make a copy of DNA because you need to have DNA for each cell that you make. So DNA replication is the process in which DNA makes this exact copy of the original DNA strand. It takes place in the nucleus of eukaryotic cells where DNA is stored. And this happens during what we call the S phase of interphase, which is a stage of our cell cycle and it is prior to the cell actually dividing. The process results in two identical DNA helices. So they should look the exact same at the end of the process. So now we're gonna go through the steps of how this replication uh, occurs. So before we get to the specific steps, the process is called semi-conservative, meaning to save some, because each copy of DNA consists of one old strand of the original DNA that serves as our template and one new strand. As you can see in this picture here, we start with our purple DNA, and in the end we have two, but each one has one strand of that original purple DNA. So let's go through each specific step and how we have the semi-conservative process take place. So we start with an enzyme called DNA helicase. It's going to unwind or unzip the DNA molecule into its two strands. Since DNA is this double-stranded molecule that's twisted in this helix shape, we have to unravel that and separate it out. This is going to create what we call the replication fork. So the yellow structure here represents helicase and where the DNA is opening up, that is our replication fork. Each strand is going to serve as a template so that we know how to build our new complementary strands to make our new DNA molecule. Now DNA has directionality. Sort of if you were to tell someone you go left to right, DNA has its left to right known as three prime and five prime. So this is based off of which carbon of the deoxyribose sugar is at the end. So the three prime end, you're going to have the three prime sugar being the one. So the third sugar in the pentagon will be at this end. And then the fifth sugar of the pentagon will be here. It's a little confusing, but it's important to understand that we have this directionality. And since we have 
two complementary strands, they're going to go in the reverse orientation of each other. So one strand will start with a three prime end and go to the five prime end. And then the reverse on the other strand will be five prime to three prime. So we start with opening up the DNA and we have this directionality of our strands. Then we're going to have another enzyme come in called DNA polymerase, which is represented by the green structures on the diagram. DNA polymerase comes in and reads the template strand and binds in the complementary nucleotides using those base pairing rules that I mentioned earlier. A, we'll put a T in. If there's a C, we'll put in a G and vice versa. So the strands are going to be different based off of their uh, directionality. We have what's called the leading strand, and that's going to be your three prime to five prime strand. And that's because DNA polymerase reads DNA in that direction. Just like if you read a book left to right, the natural way you're going to read that book and it's going to make sense to you, that's the same for DNA polymerase. It can only read in that direction and make sense from three prime to five prime. So the strand that's already in that direction is going to be our leading strand because DNA polymerase can come in and add in the new nucleotides in one smooth, continuous mo movement. The other strand, however, is in the reverse direction. And DNA polymerase is not going to change how it reads DNA. So it's still going to go from the three prime to five prime end, but it has to wait for helicase to open the DNA. So it goes to three prime, starts adding in the nucleotides, more of the DNA is open, it'll go to the replication fork, and so it's going to be detaching and going back over and over. This is going to leave these gaps and create these chunks, which are called Okasaki fragments. So we're going to have these Okasaki fragments here with little gaps in between. So we're making, in this stage, the new strands, and one is going to be going nice and smoothly, and the other one's going to be built in fragments. So we're going to need one more enzyme. That enzyme is called ligase. It is going to move along the lagging strand and fill in those gaps with the complementary nucleotides that are necessary. And so therefore, we're going to have a full strand of DNA instead of these chunks. Once ligase has come and fixed the lagging strand, we should have two identical DNA molecules. And this is because of that base pairing rule, the complementary nature of DNA. They should look the exact same as each other. So you will have your old strand. So this was our lagging strand, five prime to three prime. We built in with our DNA polymerase, these new uh, nucleotides and filled it in with ligase. And so we're going to have two strands complement each other, one old and one new. And of course, on our leading strand, we started with three prime to five prime and DNA polymerase came in and built the new strand here. So each of these uh, molecules have part old and part new, giving us that semi-conservative nature of DNA replication. So this process is very important because we're making the copies of DNA that are necessary for the cells to have the instructions they need. So with growing, repairing, and reproduction of living organisms, you need new cells, but you can't have cells without that blueprint. And so we make the copy of the blueprint to make sure that we have the correct cells that we need for all living organisms. So I hope these notes help you better understand DNA and its process of replicating. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments, or if there's anything else I need to clarify, please let me know. Thank you.